I think we heard that a lot of our involvement is optional for governments. Optional for governments to include us in various stages of the review process, optional for them to publish information that we need. And that increases our task and our burden. But I would say to those who are concerned about whether it's worthwhile, being involved in this process enables you to build public awareness about corruption and about UNCAC obligations. So it's, it's a platform. Being involved in the process opens the door for you to communicate with your government about ec your expectations as to their performance, both in the process itself and in terms of UNCAC implementation. Of course, by being involved, a, a key aim is to enhance the accuracy and reliability and usefulness of the assessment. Because if the government alone is making the input, of course, they may not see their own flaws. We also see it as an opportunity to demonstrate the role of civil society in anti-corruption, to demonstrate our interest and our competence in contributing to this process. And we can use this official platform, again, for outreach to the government, but also to the national public in our countries to make points about government implementation or otherwise. And very importantly, and very useful, especially in some countries where it's difficult to talk to the government, we can use it to talk to the international community regarding our concerns about our government's performance. So there, there are various moments and entry points and opportunities where we can, where it's important to check how the process is running. There's a moment when the government appoints a focal point. There's a moment when the government conducts a self-assessment. So a very useful thing to do, as far as you can, is to contact the government. Even if you can't find the focal point, I'm sure you, have, you know some government um, representatives who, who you can communicate with and tell them you're going to be monitoring the UNCAC review process. This can be very helpful for motivating governments. There's the peer review and dialogue phase. As you know, there are options for the government to include civil society or not, to conduct a country visit or not. It is very important actually to get the long report and we know that there are some governments that are resisting that idea. They may feel that the information will be somehow harm them. But um, that's also an area for, for advocacy. And again, um, I think it helps to, for you to communicate to your governments that you're monitoring this whole process. And at the end, because that, and that will be the end point, to prepare a report on how the process has gone. The most powerful way to be convincing both your government and the reviewers to take your input seriously um, would be to, to be doing very competent and well-founded and well-researched reports, which are very difficult to refute. If they come up with a different result, they will actually look foolish. There's an implementation review group, as you know, which currently doesn't admit officially civil society participation, but this is a subject that's under discussion. And if not officially, we can make unofficial submissions to that group. And we may make official submissions to the Conference of States Parties, the next one taking place in, in Marrakesh in October. So your reports won't be lost. There, there are all sorts of ways of using them. And then it's also very important, and we can, we can multiply the effect of, of, of these reports, both on the process and the content, by building coalitions that um, have co-ownership of them. Some of the sort of general principles of devising an advocacy strategy, which are, of course, identifying the aims and objectives, organizing yourselves, devising your strategy objectives to, to have an influence, developing an activity plan, and then conducting monitoring and evaluation. And so first off, you know, the issue of what needs to change. I don't know if you're all familiar with the SMART objectives, but I think we very clearly in the process area have very SMART objectives. Um, 
what are your capacity and resources what, and, and challenges? So conducting a SWOT analysis, which is analyzing strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Thinking about how to influence change, who are the key decision makers that you have to influence? What is the environment? Again, some of you are in hostile environments, some are in friendly. Who are the stakeholders? Who are the people you can mobilize on your side, allies? Who are, who are those who are liable to oppose your involvement or your inputs? How to go about your advocacy, what kind of messaging. Um, in some countries, you may favor a soft diplomatic approach. You may find that that's more effective um, in the long run, uh, that maybe your government will react negatively towards a forceful kind of demand approach. Um, others won't hear anything else. How do you mobilize other actors who have influence? For example, the private sector may be an important ally. In this process, uh, the involvement of civil society is um, essential. So to do this, um, my approach would, would be uh, to be visible in eyes of um, governments, governmental officials, and also the public, the society of your country. Uh, be active and reactive. 